Elizabeth. Hello, Jenny. How are you? I'm very well. Can you hear me? You can hear me, obviously. Yes. Um, thank you very much for joining me in this discussion. I'll just say a few words about Elizabeth before we start the conversation. Um, professor Dame Elizabeth Neke Anyonwu is an emeritus professor of nursing at the University of West London. And she set up the first ever sickle cell and thalassemia nurse counselling service in Brent in 1979. You can read more about Elizabeth on her, um, on her website. And please read her memoir. Um, the other thing is, is that Elizabeth was appointed to the Order of Merit in November, just this month. And you heard from um, Baroness Amos this morning what a really important honour that is. Only 24 people in the country at a time have the Order of Merit. So congratulations, Elizabeth. <laughs> so, Elizabeth, you and I have known each other for quite some time. Do you remember when we first met? Oh, it, uh, we're going back to the 1970s, Jenny. <clears throat> So there's probably people who in the audience who probably weren't even born then. Um, <laughs> Possibly their children weren't even born then. <laughs> and um, it was a sickle cell event, wasn't it? Um, it was. It was. Yeah. And it was in Birmingham. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So we've known each other for a long time and Elizabeth has been involved in activism around sickle cell since that time. So you've done an inc incredible amount of work to improve services for people who have sickle cell and thalassemia. How did you get in and why did you get involved in this area of work? Um, I like to explain it by talking about the three P's because, um, and the P's stand for professional, personal and political. And, um, so from the professional point of view, I was a health visitor in the early 1970s in Brent, Northwest London. And that's where I came across the first family who had, uh, uh, with a child affected by sickle cell anemia. And I couldn't support the family in providing them with information. And, you know, if it was a condition like epilepsy or asthma, as a health visitor, we try and support families in terms of the, helping them prevent the condition getting worse or, you know, but sickle cell, I'd never heard of it. So I was actually quite angry. I, I was embarrassed because I didn't know about the illness, but I was really angry with my um, nursing and health visiting education courses, which I had completed in the late 60s and early 1970s. None of those courses um, mentioned sickle cell at all. And those courses were in London. And, you know, when I started to realize how significant the illness was, particularly within the black community, although it, it's not solely confined to the, that, the, 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 those communities, um, that made me even angrier, to be quite honest, you know, yeah. So I, um, I think that, well, not I think, I know that spurred me on, Jenny, to link in with like-minded people and which also meant going over to the States on cheap holiday packages. And the reason being, it was the States that were leading the way in the community. I mean, I think we used to call it community development, didn't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. Way back. In other words, not looking at it from the institutional point of view, not looking at it from the hospital point of view or the NHS point of view, looking at it more from the, 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 the views and the needs of those affected by the condition and what they, what they wanted to do, what they, what they saw it was, as was necessary to improve the quality of life for uh, their family and themselves. Okay, so you've done a lot of work, you know, changing services. Do you see yourself as an activist? I think I, I, we, we, we were more likely to use the term campaigner um, in, 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 in that era. Um, so, you know, I presume activist is similar to somebody who's been involved with others in campaigning, yeah. So, 
So um, why do you think you're effective in changing and co-producing services? Because, you know, things have changed in relation to services for sickle cell and thalassemia. Well, I think that, that I think having a questioning mind and not accepting the status quo, even if it causes you difficulties and, you know, robs you, you know, annoy, let's just say irritates people. You, I think I was able to ignore when managers and people in authority were, were, were very irate with me um, because the bigger the bigger issue was more important in other words developing the services so I had a very very thick skin it, not that it didn't affect me but I had a wonderful support group systems as I mean I'm looking back at this and sort of you know people talk about support systems I don't think we called it that in those days it was just knowing that you had you were working with like-minded people that was number one secondly I, I I am very interested in the evidence and realized very quickly that you had to demonstrate the evidence of need with policy makers and managers who were very well were quite ignorant number one some of them were quite racist as well thirdly they held the purse strings and you know you really had to have a good argument for those fingers of theirs to start loosening the purse strings of, of uh, their purse strings so and i think we the people i was involved with we all we all thought very quickly on our feet i think we were so used to being told no at every turn that we realized we had to respond very quickly with, with evidence, with information. And the most important um, driver, the, the most important factor was listen, having the ability to listen to the experience of those affected by the condition. So that's either the individual, the child or the adolescent or the adult with the illness and the family uh, 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 and carers of that individual, because they were the ones that totally realized what was lacking in the system yeah. and frustrated by it and wanting improvements. And, and these were also people that were very scared during that era. They were very scared that they might die of the condition or that their loved one or, or, their, or their partner or their relative might die. So fear played a much more important role, I think, than it does today. I think there is still anxiety, but the death rate, sadly, of those affected by sickle cell disease during the 1970s, um, 1980s to some extent, uh, were quite alarming at times. So there was, I think there was that urgency, particularly when we were aware of the better quality of life. Similar individuals, for example, in the United States, in those parts of the United States, where um, the civil rights activists and the health professionals who were interested and the politicians who were interested had, had um, garnered change in the services, you could, you could see the improvements in the quality of life for those affected by sickle cell disease. Thank you. So, but not only were you kind of instrumental in terms of changing services for sickle cell, but you were also quite instrumental in getting the Mary Seacole statue erected in London. So what were the challenges to achieving this? Well, first of all, I was invited by Lord Clive Soley. Lord Soley had, had had been a Labour MP in, 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 in the area where I live, in London. So I knew him a little bit from that. And then he got elevated to the House of Lords. And he, he had been approached by three Caribbean women in his constituency when he was an MP, who said that they should, he should support them in trying to get a statue for Mary Seacole. So that's how the idea for a Mary Seacole statue appeal started. And I had, I had been angry again because I hadn't been taught about Mary Seacole in my nursing and health visiting courses. And I only found out about her, oh, I think it was 1984, 
when her autobiography, her 1857 autobiography was brought out again for the first time. So, um, so anger, anger is very, has been very important to me. I don't think anger should be seen negatively if it, if it enables you to work with others to improve things. Um, so uh, Lord Soli had heard about me. I was running the Mary Seacole Centre for Nursing Practice at, at the University of West London. And I'd named it after Mary Seacole because I discovered that many of the student nurses didn't know about it and neither did many of the nurse tutors. So I've got a weird sense of humour. I thought, well, I, I knew I was going to set up a, a research centre. Uh, but well, what can I name it? And I thought, well, actually, if I name it after Mary Seacole, people are going to have to say, who's she? And it will help raise the profile, which is exactly what, what happened. So um, that because of all of that, Lord Soli approached me and oh, about 10 other people to join forces with him in 2003 to raise funds and awareness, of course, um, for the Mary Seacole statue. And it took nearly 13 years for our um, team and a whole heap of volunteers, a huge amount of volunteers, to raise three quarters of a million pounds for this magnificent memorial statue that is in the grounds now of St. Thomas's Hospital for, for anybody who hasn't seen it, um, who might be in the Westminster Waterloo area. Um, it, this, the, the memorial statue is in the grounds of St. Thomas's Hospital. It's well, worth, it's well worth seeing, of course, particularly because it was the first statue of a named black woman in this country. And it got uh, unveiled in 2016, yeah. So what advice would you give to other black women who want to change services, create change? Well, first of all, have that inner confidence that you can, you, you, you have got something to offer. We have, I think many of us have grown up with a lack of confidence. I mean, maybe that's getting less now, I don't know. But as black women, we weren't seen as anything special within society. So you have to knock that aside and know that we are very powerful women and have a lot to um, uh, give society. So there's, so there's that. Uh, and, and, and develop this confidence by, I think it's quite common sense, but sometimes I come across people who haven't really been advised uh, about such strategies. So first of all, learn a lot about black women that you admire. Um, link in with like-minded people because you can get very down with the negative feedback you can get um, from what is a racist society. Um, it's, it, I'm not saying it's all the time. And in fact, you, you, I think the most difficult times are when you think everything is going very well and you, you're all very pleased with yourself and the project is going well. And then somebody wins you, you know, just takes your breath away with some horrendous, statement or behavior and it just reminds you hold on there, there are still negative forces out there so you you need to have your support mechanisms in place and people are have always been the most important support mechanisms for me um, and that's definitely what happened with the uh, Mary Seacor statue appeal um, and also the development of sickle cell services because there were always the naysayers oh no it's not not important no you're never going to do it there's things that are much more important um and usually they're white issues and you know well it's only a minority issue isn't it elizabeth no it isn't actually <laughs> samantha or whoever it is um, <laughs> whoever it is um so yeah i think um working with others developing your confidence and finally really doing your research about the project that you're involved in because you're going to be challenged constantly and I, I, I think it's common sense not to get involved in something that you don't know too much about yourself. So I hope those are, are some hints that might be helpful. So thanks very much, Elizabeth. Is there anything you still want to change? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Racism in society would be a good start, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. Um, so the, I've, I've had to acknowledge gradually as I've grown up that I don't think racism will ever go away. 
but that's not to say that we don't challenge it and we don't accept it. Um, so that's, that's uh, yeah, I think that's the biggie. Okay, just to, before we end, would you like to say just a few words about the memoir you've written? Oh, that's very sweet of you. Um, Jenny's my PR agent, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Jenny. So uh, can you see that, um, everybody? Yeah, we can all see, yeah. So it's called Dreams from My Mother, and it's, um, you can get it on Amazon and Kindle, and also it's an audio book. So if you like the sound of my voice, you never know. Um, <laughs> I actually did read the book for the audio book. So, you know, you can get that from, oh, I don't know, wherever you get your audio book from, yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's lovely. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for taking time out of your, your day to actually um, be part of our conference. And I've worked with you for so many years, and I hope we will continue to do exciting work in the future. Oh, I'm, I'm sure we will, Jenny. And um, can I give you a big pat on the back, um, Jenny, for all your years involved with activism and never giving up. And, you know, pl please study Jenny, all of you out there, because she's she's an incredible role model. So, um, and thank you for inviting me into your event today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Bye for now. Bye, bye, bye.